we say we in a society today where something wrong institutionally. Even before we saw our institutions fail miserably and lead us into the current recession, even before that, we saw and felt the need to meet the challenge of growing disparities and expanding poverty. The poor are getting poorer and more, while the rich are getting richer and fewer proportionately. We live in a society where five to six percent of the people own or control 95 percent of the wealth. I would suggest that this is an intolerable condition and that we cannot truly honor the movement led by Martin Luther King, not the ministry and mission of Martin, without grappling with these failures. Our institution fail us and lead us into economic crises such as we now experience. There's something wrong among us when a handful of people have more than they ever need, while the multitudes have less than they always need. I should have got at least one amen, I think. I'm going to try it again. Something wrong with a system when a handful of people have more than they'll ever need, while a multitude of people have less than they always need. Amen. We've come to a place today, and someone asked me in the press, meeting this morning, how would you describe today's condition? Well, that's difficult. I have a sermon I preached some years ago called Everything Has Changed and Nothing Has Changed. It's paradoxical. And that's, I think, where we are. We have a black household in the White House, but there are those who would see the nation sink to all kind of confusion in order to bring down that administration. Right. Celebration of Martin's birthday, ministry, vision, and mission is a mighty good time to renew our pledge, to renew our vows. A half century of pastoring, I never fail with any couple I married. To charge them that every year at the anniversary of their wedding, they ought to renew their vows. If they couldn't find a preacher, take the book and ask themselves the questions. And then take a moment to talk about how well they fulfilled those vows. And then they might give each other a grade. And then they need to have a referee there. <laughs> But what a good time to, to renew the nation's commitment to racial justice and human dignity and world peace. There are so many troubling things today that challenge us if we're serious, not serious, serious about honoring Martin Luther King. Serious is like a headache. Serious is like a heart attack. And unless we get serious about changing the course of, you know, let, let, me, let me be perfectly frank. What's his name? Bill Moore. Have you ever watched Bill Moore? Bill Moore said, we're not a smart people. He said, we're smart about some things, but pretty dumb about others. And here's what he said. I'm quoting him. And I, let me clarify something. And I'm neither Democrat no Republican. I'm Methodist. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not making any partisan speech, but let me tell you what he said. He said that any nation that would elect, and I'm not going to call the name, certain person president twice <laughs> cannot be a smart people. <laughs> and let me tell you something else. 
Let me tell you a study was made. I don't know who made it. I got to go back and find it. I saw it on CNN the other morning in Minneapolis. I got up and a study was made and parents across the nation were asked, do you think children ought to learn a second language? Would you believe that half the parents said no? How can a thinking astute people in a global economy and a global shrinking global situation dare say that that child ought not learn a second language. One of the things I learned when I first went to Europe that kids over there speak not two but sometimes four and five languages by the time they finish high school. And we have trouble, in fact, I haven't mastered English yet. <laughs> I might even flunk a course in Ebonics. <laughs> but there's something wrong, and, and, and what a challenge it is to the academic community to realize that we have come a long way, but that we've still got a long, long way to go. Right now, as many have said, and Wednesday night I was in the Kennedy Library, where three or four hundred people came to talk about King's birthday and the current climate in our country. And one fellow, and he was white, I was glad he was white, who stood up and said that he is fearful that much of the opposition and fury directed at health reform and other levels of concern and agenda of the Obama administration are based on race as much as anything else. As a matter of fact, I remember one of the Tea Party people who came to a, to a, a, a town hall meeting once stood up and said brilliantly, I don't want the government messing with my Medicaid. We are challenged. <laughs> and I, you know, I hesitate to say that's why I'm glad he was white. Because black agitators, and I, 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 I've grown, I matured a lot to call myself an agitator. When I, I was passing in Mobile, Alabama, and I left there in 1961 to go and serve administrative assistance to the bishop of the Nashville, Birmingham area. And a headline appeared in the paper, local agitator leaves town. <laughs> and I was offended. And I'll never forget Sister Ella McAllister, member of the church, was there at a little meeting and I mentioned it. And she said, Reverend, don't be offended. Can you take me home? I see. I'll drive you home. She drove her home. She had one of these old-fashioned houses with a great big hall right down the middle and rooms on each side of the hall. And at the back of the hall was a porch that ran all the way across the width of the house. And there was a brand new washing machine sitting on the middle of the porch. And she carried me to it and she said, see that red thing in the middle? She says, that's an agitator. <laughs> Nothing will happen to separate the dirt from the clothes until that agitator does its work. <laughs> I felt... I felt different about an agitator. And so, and so we need today effective agitation. And I challenge the students you are, you are our most promising, brightest generation yet. Makes no difference what your parents or your grandparents say. You are the brightest generation. <laughs> I get on my computer, and there's something about computers. They don't like old folks. <laughs> but I call my grandson. He doesn't even have to come over. I can explain the problem. And over the phone, usually, he can help me repair 
the situation. And I challenge you 